please welcome with me César Junk Arada. César Junk Arada is a French Japanese designer, environmentalist, educator, and entrepreneur, passionate about ocean technology, impact innovation, and education. Based in Singapore, César is an associate professor of design at the Singapore Institute of Technology. He is currently a candidate PhD in design and ocean innovations at the CNAM in France. Directors of Mark Bay in Hong Kong, Scoot Boot Ocean Robotics Startup, César serves as trustees of the board in Qatar, the Wing Foundation in Hong Kong, and regularly delivers workshops and keynotes at international conferences in places such as United Nations, Harvard, or TED. Thank you very much to welcome with me César Young Arada. 1982. Worship. It's early in the morning and Tetsuo Harada is chiseling. He's making uh, metal peaks. He's going to be spending the whole day carving a block of about 10 tons of granite and he's you see, carving, making his own tools. What he's carving is a sculptor, sculpture sorry, that represents the ocean. Uh, it's an act of worship. Uh, he's making a sculpture that maybe a lot of people will see as a piece of art, but for him, it's sacred artwork. It's a way of him to practice uh, the religion, the Shinto religion, which is a Buddhist uh, sect uh, in Japan. And he's making um, a landscape representing the power of nature, uh, the power of the sun, the waves crashing on the rocks, and the power of people. And so the picture is only possible and is only full uh, when humans are part of the picture as well. And that's my older brother. He's five years old back then. And so uh, while this sculpture was being made, my mom was pregnant. So this sculpture was being made while, while I was in the belly of my mom. And so that's a couple of years later. And it's now in the south of France, in Bayonne, in the south, in, uh, next to Biarritz, which is a big surf town, for some of you who know that. Uh, a couple of years later, 2000, another uh, snippet image, protests. So now I'm about your age, and I'm angry. <laughs> and uh, I'm angry about uh, society, and my brother is the head of the Green Party, uh, of the Young Green Party in Paris. And uh, because I'm not yet uh, 18, he asked me to organize an illegal protest of uh, naked people. And so we organize, I'm the organizer of a naked bicycle protest, uh, and my job is to snitch on the policeman. So I am naked and I'm following policemen around. It cannot happen in Singapore, this kind of activity. <laughs> uh, so my job is to uh, cycle next to the policeman and trying to listen to their conversation because uh, my job is to make sure that key people are not being arrested uh, because there are some people who are organizer and they would be targeted. So I go around and try to get them not, not arrested. So that's, that's the result of my father's sacred work, like translated into like activist uh, work. This is more the more like gentle and funny sort of activist work I've been doing in the years. Um, I just thought it was funny for like Singapore context. Uh, and this is a picture of, I think two years ago of the climate protests. And so the movement has grown a lot and I hope a lot of you participate in this uh, climate protest. This was in March, I think it was in London. Um, yeah, I participated in the, in the last few years. Um, and there are many reasons why uh, we can be even more concerned today and even more angry. Fast forward to 2004. Support. So not protest, but this time trying to be on the solution side. Maybe you remember on the 26th of December 2004, there was a very big tsunami. Uh, there was a big earthquake, over nine power in uh, Indonesia. And I had some friends, happened to be in India at the time, uh, learning yoga in the town of Oroville. And the, their building was devastated, and a lot of their friends were, were killed. And uh, I was still a student, your age, and uh, they, I received an email, like you probably <laughs> do as well, asking me to send money to, uh, to, to help on the, on the ground. But I'm a student, and I live in the basement of my parents. I have no money. Uh, so how can I do something that is useful? So maybe I think I sent 10 euros or something like this, or like uh, in francs maybe back then. And then I felt very frustrated that it's definitely not going to make any difference. And so I proposed them to make a website uh, to help to fundraise money to uh, buy water filters. 
because what happened is that the tsunami came into uh, the land and uh, destroyed basically all the water tables. All the waters went into the well, so there was no more drinking water. And uh, in one week of making this very old school website, <laughs> uh, not very good looking, uh, there was a previous version of this, even, even worse, actually, the one that I made, but we collected 100,000 US dollars in, uh, I think, six days. And so it was enough to buy the water filter to bring water to about 5,000 people in, uh, in Oroville, in India. And so for me, that was my first step of uh, thinking like, wow, even if I don't have money, if I do a little bit something, uh, I can actually make a difference in other people's life. And I was particularly proud because nobody asked me to do it. And, um, and that's my first message to you. It's like, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah don't, don't ask for anybody to, to ask you. Fast forward to 2005. Explore. So I, I'm past the phase where I'm, you know, spending time in the police station because I did some illegal activist activity or past uh, thinking like I want to do like humanitarian. I, I want to explore the world and I want to know more what is really happening on the ground. And um, uh, I actually realized that I, I grew up mostly in the city and I never spent any time in nature. And so I decided for my diploma to make a, um, a film about landscapes, just purely landscape. And so I built myself a, a trimaran, a very small trimaran, a boat. Uh, the legal size is three meter. If you're more than three meter, you have to have a, a number plate and a license. So this boat is two meter 99.5. Uh, <laughs> and it's just, uh, just enough so I could travel by bicycle on the road and I could also go by the rivers. And so I traveled from the north to the south of France I had an accident on the road at the end, so I didn't complete all the way to the uh, Mediterranean, but it was really uh, an amazing journey. Uh, anywhere you are, basically, there's nature everywhere. And so if you are um, taking the time, investing the time uh, to connect with nature, you, you can have an amazing experience. So I made this uh, film only with landscape. Uh, you can, and, and I had to almost like a mental illness <laughs> uh, where I was constantly hearing music. I was obsessed with music, and so when I was living in the city, there's always like music playing around and noise. Once you're in nature, there's also noise. But I had this problem, I had music on my mind. And being in nature allowed me to sort of make my mind clear. And so if you go and check out this movie called Disponible, or Available uh, in, in English, uh, the, the landscape that you will see, I paired it with the music that I was hearing in my head while I was in, in nature. Uh, and so I hope you, you will enjoy the, the film. Fast forward to 2010. So I feel like I've explored a little bit, but now I feel the need to, if I want to do something good for the environment, I need to understand it not just with my senses, but I need to measure it, so collect some data. Um, I was, this is a picture I've taken in, in Kenya. At the time, I was a construction manager for uh, the first uh, co-working space in East Africa. So some of my friends uh, just wrote me this, they just announced on Facebook, I think back then, we're gonna be building a co-working space in Nairobi, we're looking for people to come and help. And I was just like, oh, I have nothing to do, so <laughs> I'm just gonna go and help. So uh, I was helping on the construction initially, uh, but then I worked very hard and uh, I became the construction manager for the whole building actually. And so I didn't have the time, some time to go home, so I would sleep on the construction site. And so these are my friends who came me up in the morning. Uh, when I, they took this picture of me and I took a picture of them. Uh, being in Nairobi in 2010, it was really an amazing time. Uh, you would see this sign like this in the street, the future is here. And there's this incredible, palpable uh, energy. Uh, in the first week I was in Nairobi, uh, I spoke to three young people who told me they want to become the president of, uh, of, of Kenya. And I just felt like, wow, some people are so, so ambitious and there's something really magical about the uh, energy there. Uh, so uh, when I arrived, there was really not much of a plan just to put a logo on the wall, <laughs> but everything has got to be uh, figured. And um, yeah, and in a couple of months, uh, we had investment from Google and Facebook and the president of Kenya came to see it. It was just like this crazy uh, sort of buildup of community. Uh, we, we organized hundreds of events and trained thousands of people and really built up the startup economy uh, in, in, uh, in Nairobi, in Kenya. Eventually, uh, the company was acquired a couple of, this, uh, couple of years ago, but uh, for years, it was really like the beating heart of the sort of startup ecosystem in, in East Africa. Uh, but what was interesting to me in particular, there was one non-profit called Ushahidi. It's a Swahili word, and what it actually was about was it's an app. It was, do you remember, 2009 or 2010. Uh, you, you use your mobile phone, and you can post an SMS or send a message, 
and it would automatically create a map. So right now it's super simple technology and I'm sure you guys can pretty much all like code it. Uh, but back then it was really, really cool and new. And it was used in this case, in the map here, uh, to map the post-election violence in Kenya. So after the election, people got really angry with the results and people started to hunt each other down and even kill each other. Uh, but what happened is that this software built in Africa uh, started to track an environmental catastrophe on the other side of the world. So this company, Shahidi, was based in IHOB. And so at the same time, in April 2010, uh, the BP oil spill started. So who remember the BP oil spill? Raise your hand. BP oil spill. Wow, quite a few, not, not so many people. It was the biggest environmental accident in the history of North America. Uh, the, 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 the oil spill, like the size of Singapore, Singapore is probably like about this size, roughly. So the oil spill was like many times the size of Singapore. Uh, the place completely covered with oil. And so millions of uh, birds died and fish died and people started to lose their job. The industry, everything was down. So that's a satellite imagery. So NOAA and American government were receiving data, but uh, the nonprofit with this uh, Ushahidi app, started, people started to post a lot of reports. And because it was an underspecified and open source software, we started to have more reports than the American government. And a lot of stuff that people wouldn't give to NOAA. Because, for example, NOAA would only accept really official data, like the amount of oil that they can measure in one location. But here, people would report, for example, there's bad smell. Or they would, re they would say that I have a skin rash, or I have problem breathing because of the smell. And so we had more data, and a lot of it was sort of informal data. Uh, and so that's, that's why we started to have more information. Because of these data sets uh, that we started to share online, I was called to join a team to actually uh, sort of collect data about the BP oil spill and start to uh, organize the cleanup operation. And so I joined a team at MIT. So I was called by a team at MIT to actually join and work on the cleanup operations. And so at MIT, it was really amazing to be there, given that my background is in the arts, <laughs> to arrive there and to start to work on like scientific and engineering project. And it felt like I was kind of joining like a gang, like a clique. Uh, this is actually oil, you know, O-I-L. And this is like Pac-Man. So it's not really like a gang sign, but yeah. Uh, and so uh, having the access to this, uh, this place was really amazing. You have this uh, access to this robotics lab, which is like pretty much like best, best lab you can imagine. And also like really cool sailing club. So it was like a dream place for me. Uh, having access to the ocean and having access to robotics. And this really amazing hacker space called Miters. It's actually not like the fancy lab, but it's kind of the hacker space. And it's in the basement of the museum. And you could go there 24 hours and you could eat and sleep there and do whatever you, the heck you want. And so that was like my favorite place in, in MIT. And that was the project I was working on. It's called Sea Swarm. So it's basically a conveyor belt technology. And it's got this uh, super absorbent nanotechnology. And we basically would suck up the oil. And you heat it up. And you can use the oil again. And so the idea would be to have a lot of these small robots. Um, the idea was, I think, quite interesting. But I think it was quite expensive. And it was going to be uh, private. It was going to be a, a closed source. And I started to get a bit, uh, myself, even uh, skeptical about our own design. And so I wanted to go and test it in the field. So one weekend, I decided to use my own money and then fly over. Because the lab, they were like, no, just focus on your lab work. If it works in the lab, it's good enough. We can get the grant money. You know, it's good enough. But I was like, no, no, no. If you're going to take public money, I want to make sure that it's going to work. So I, I flew there. And I met the people who work on the BPL spiel, like, uh, actually, actually there. And this is a another sort of s snapshot, turning moment. So the guy on the left, as you can see, uh, when I went to uh, map the BP hospital, collect some samples, uh, I saw the guy arriving in a wheelchair. He's the captain of the boat. So I was like, oh my god, he's going to be here. Uh, I wasn't sure he could even get on the boat, because you have to you know, get from the, from the pier into the water. But he basically threw his body inside like a, like a bag of potatoes and just landed there. And then he drove us there. And I'm very straightforward as a guy. And so I just asked him, what happened to, to your leg? And so he explained to me that he lost his first leg in 2005, so five years prior, because of Katrina. It was Katrina, and he was fishing. He was shrimping, by getting some shrimp. And Katrina came, and he still had to go out and make some money. And so he was out. And he was a captain. He had several boats. And he lost two other of the boats that he had with, the, with his friends uh, inside of the boat. And so he was in the boat, and there was a lot of shaking, etc. And while, the, while in the storm, his leg got caught into a, uh, got crushed basically by some equipment. So he lost his first leg uh, in Katrina. 
And then because he's lost two of his three boats and most of his, a lot of his friends, uh, he had to, after he recovered, uh, he actually kept working day shift and night shift because he was trying to support the family of his friend who, who passed away. Um, and so one night, one night shift, uh, one, see, his other leg, the remaining leg, got caught into a, a net, uh, that, the, the, the hoist that lifts the net. And so now it's the BPO spill. It's no longer illegal to fish because there's oil in the water, so you cannot fish. Uh, you cannot uh, take oil, there's no more tourism. Uh, basically, like all the industry have stopped. And the last thing that is left for him is to take people like us to take pictures or take samples on the oil spill. But he was telling me uh, that actually the, the hardest part, and this is not that, is that yesterday his best friend uh, shot himself. Uh, what happened is that his best friend was working on the BP oil spill, and because of the toxic they used to make the oil uh, thicker, to be easier to collect, his friend got sick, uh, and then he's, because he got sick, he couldn't work anymore and, and provide for his family. And so his friend's family left and then he just shot himself. And so what I realized in that moment was that when you have an environmental catastrophe, yes, it's dirty, of course. Of course, there's an environmental cost, but then it destroys industries. It destroyed the fishing industry. It destroyed the oil industry. Of course, it destroyed the, the tourism industry. Basically, there's, there's nothing left. And so it, it, like, when you think about environmental, you th you, usually you think like, oh, plastic bottles in nature, or like, oh, poor turtle, or something like that. But actually, it's much, much more. And down the line, there's always people who actually are dependent on the environment, and who, are, who will be on the first line, on the front line. And so back then, in my lab, I was asked to you know, uh, like continue to do this project and raise millions of dollars for this technology. But then when I saw uh, how people's life are affected, uh, then I was like, well, our technology maybe cannot make so much of a difference. It will, and it will not be uh, uh, used by them. It would be the technology to replace them. If we make those AI and robotics technology, uh, the agenda is actually getting rid of people who are supposed to do uh, the, the cleanup work, for whom is the very last thing that they have. And so um, for me, I, I, on the way back to, to Boston, I was thinking, how is it possible that we're developing technology that is centralized, that is patented, expensive, and we're doing, it's going to take us years to develop this technology? Can we do a different approach? Can we do something that's community-based, open source, and low cost, and do it much faster? And I had no idea how to do that, but I thought that I had to do something completely different, opposite of what I learned in school. And so uh, this is what I've tried. So because I had no idea how to do it, the first thing I've done is quit my dream job. So I left MIT and I moved to the Gulf of Mexico. I had no plans when I arrived there. I had $10 in my pocket, so I had to do a bunch of, of little jobs. But I was also volunteering. So I was volunteering first to map the BPO oil spill so first I helped on the cleanup, just to remove it. But then quickly, uh, BP made it illegal for people to actually remove the oil themselves. Because BP, uh, BP's oil was on the site, they say it's our property. So it's not legal for people to remove their property. It was theirs. And they made it so that only BP employee could clean up. So they made it so that they would become the contractor for the cleanup. So they earn money from cleanup operations now. And they made it illegal, so it means that you would be fine. You'd be basically, if you take oil, cleaning oil, you'd be basically stealing BP property. And that'd be a class D felony. And for a foreigner like me, not American, it means that I'd be basically kicked out of America and never be able to, to come back. So the only thing that we could do with the other activists, we could not touch the oil, we could not get close to the oil, we we're not even allowed in proximity to the oil, we had to fly above the oil. And so what we did is that 2009, Drones are very expensive. So the cheaper option for us was party balloons. <laughs> so we just get a bunch of party balloons and we fly them above and we start to attach cameras. We attach cameras in plastic bottles and those, cam those cameras we fly above the polluted site and we take thousands of pictures of the oil sites. And then we stitch those images together and then we give those pictures to the residents and those residents would take BP to court and they say, hey, my beach is still extremely uh, dirty, it's full of oil. And over time, we develop systems for making UV photography, so we also hack the camera, and we start to make them so that the oil will really pop out, and you can really see the oil on, on the picture. So as uh, we were working on the, cleanup oper uh, on the mapping operations, I kept thinking, how can we actually clean it up? It's nice to measure and figure where it is, but I want to remove it. I want to remove it also in the sea. 
as soon as you get it on the beach, it's already too late. It's already affected so much uh, the biology. So in 2010, I started to save up a bit of money, and I continued to e experiment. So I don't have the resource of MIT, uh, but I borrow the garage of an old lady uh, in New Orleans, and I start to hack little boats. I'm thinking, is there a way that I could pull an oil absorbent? So the sponge that sucks up the oil, can I control it? And I thought, if I don't have money to operate like a real boat, could I use a sailboat? Because it's using the natural forces. In fact, the oil spill is a man-made catastrophe, but once the oil is in the wild, it's controlled by natural forces, the wind, the current, the waves. So could I use a boat? And so here, the boat that I modify, I put the rudder at the front. And I start to have a bit better control. And then I start to think, could I put a rudder at the front and another one at the back? So two rudders instead of one, like a four-wheel drive car. And then little by little, I just think, what about if I just control the whole boat? If I make the whole boat to be curved? So, and I just, well, just like the fish. This is how a fish works, right? Like nothing special about it. And then I try to build it, and it really works really well. And I can really have much, much better control, more stability, and I can really control the payload. It's like I can use the wind and I can drag something long and heavy behind. And so um, I keep making more and more prototype. And then I was like, okay, maybe I have something valuable. And so I started to post it online and I started to make it open source. And I check, did anybody invent this before? No, nobody invented this before. And so I, instead of getting a patent, I make it, I license it as open source and figure that you can go up the wind much better, and you can tack and maneuver, uh, or uh, empanage or viande uh, 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 bord much, much better. And so the evolution has been, uh, sorry, French. <laughs> uh, so the, the evolution has been very like uh, sort of organic and also very chaotic. Sometimes you invent something and it works. Most of the time you invent some stuff and it doesn't work. And it was also kind of frustrating, but the, the key was also working always super low cost. So for example, this prototype is one point, uh, it's two meters roughly, and it costs less than $50. It's just some plastic tubes from the hardware store um, and some you know, plastic sheets, uh, like a bicycle or like tent pump or matlas pump. And then we crowdfund, and I'll talk about this a bit more, but then we collect enough money to actually make larger and more complex robotics prototype. And this is the largest that we've built. It's three meters, uh, but it's powerful enough to actually drag 25 meters of payload. And this one was built in the uh, Netherlands. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, increase in control and efficiency, <laughs> uh, more maneuverability, and uh, since 2010, this technology has been then uh, adapted to be used by NASA and Boeing to build airplane wings. And so you might see in the future airplane wings with that very same system. They'll be using muscle wire, so instead of having those tabs, it's actually curving the whole wing of the airplane. And we're looking at a 25% increase in lift, so it means that the same wing can lift 25% more weight, and we're looking at reducing, um, uh, reducing a lot of the fuel, basically, and reducing turbulences, so making airplanes safer, faster, um, less turbulent, and cheaper to operate. So everything is open source. You can actually go online and find the, the software and everything. And so working open source, contrary to working in MIT, allowed me to actually make this completely uh, open. And so the community started to grow. Um, this technology back then uh, uh, was the second project uh, ever, technology project on Kickstarter. Kickstarter and I is a very big platform, but back then it was very small. I just bumped into the founder of Kickstarter. Uh, back then he was also a DJ uh, in New Orleans. And I just bumped into him and so uh, made the, the, the campaign. And back then, $33,000 was a lot of money. Uh, now it's, like, it's like a, almost like a fair campaign, but back then it was, it was one of the biggest campaigns back then. And so with the money that we collect, uh, we're able to spend Again, very transparently. And then we can test not just my idea, but we try all the people's idea. So we flew people from different parts of the world in Rotterdam, and we could build all these prototypes. And so the idea is that uh, if we work in open source, we can work much, much faster and collaboratively. Uh, yeah, so, so then the, the, the boat ended up in some uh, arts and, and science, science museum around the world. But then I kept thinking, uh, it's cool to be shape-shifting, but could we even go further and make uh, this kind of boat actually uh, carry more, more capacity? And so instead of just having like, the payloads and the boat, could actually we build the boat like trains? And so instead of building in the water because it was too expensive to put all the electronics in the water, then I just try on the land. 
And uh, so this test was made in Estonia. So you can hear like I'm talking about different countries because every time we find money, so some, some, somebody left a comment from Estonia and say, hey, we love what you do, it's cool. Would you like to do this in Estonia? I say, yeah, of course we'll do it in Estonia if you give us money. <laughs> and so I ended up like going all around the world uh, with those kind of projects. Uh, and then we tried to see, is it scalable? So this machine is seven meters in, in length and uh, the power to control it is the same amount of power you need to control just a, a mobile phone. Uh, so it means that you can make a large vehicle and, they can, and you can control them with very, very small amounts of, of power. So yeah, so the idea is that we could, and, and it's transferable for boats, it's more maneuverable. We haven't built something that is much longer than this, but basically the idea is that yes, we could build boats like we could build train and have modular shape shifting like soft, soft boats. So the key is that we put the documentation also before we build it and get feedback before we build. And then we uh, put also a test file and we ask aggressive feedback. So we, we, we have a lot of people who are like volunteers uh, who are professionals. They don't have time to work with us, but they can give us maybe some feedback. And so we'd send them the file for testing before we build it. And then we will ask them to give us the, the tough love, like tell us what we did wrong. And so like this, even if they cannot spend a lot of time because it's a lot of volunteer work, they could still contribute to make this technology better. And even during the test, People send us a message on YouTube or Facebook Live, and they say, you know, like your mast is too heavy, or you need to add more weight, or add more motors, or you know, change stuff. And, and so in real time, we actually change the prototype during the test. Everything is documented on Instructables. People give us the, the tough love, they give us the hard feedback. Uh, and we, we don't really know, but the technology we expect could be quite scalable. So we don't know how big we can, we can make it, but we expect that it could be improving performances for, for selling boat in general. So 2013, I had this technology, shape-shifting boat, and thinking, how could I scale it? If this technology can really improve how we collect oil spill, if it can improve like, uh, like shipping in general, how can I make it faster and bigger? And so I was lucky to get into, a, I was based in San Francisco, uh, moved, to, to move, moved from New Orleans to San Francisco, uh, because I thought this is the Silicon Valley, this is where you can like, make any sort of technology happen. Uh, but I keep applying for competition, and I got into this, um, I have this simple list of material, uh, so to make this uh, small version of the, of the boat. And I'm thinking, how can I manufacture it? And I got into an incubator called Unreasonable at Sea. This incubator is inside of a university, and this university is on a ship, and that ship sails around the world. So we, we left from San Francisco, crossed to Hawaii, uh, go to Japan, you, you can see all these places. And so I was able to build a version of the boat in every port and test this boat in every water and then pitch uh, this technology in port to the local people, the fishermen, the potential investor, academics, and try to see if this idea has some legs. And so, yes, yeah, so for example, this is a picture from uh, Ghana in, uh, in Axum, next to Accra. And this is in Casablanca in Morocco. And every place where we stop, we try to build this prototype and see if people understand or appreciate the technology. Eventually, I found that making this boat in China, in Hong Kong slash Shenzhen, it would be seven times cheaper than San Francisco and four times faster. And so I talked to my investor, and my investor said, OK, you're moving to China. And so in 2013, I moved from San Francisco to Hong Kong. But when I arrived there, I am a broke uh, um, inventor, <laughs> so I don't have money to... Uh, I was actually given free space by the government, but it's in a science park, and it was very boring. It was very <laughs> uh, they wouldn't allow you to make a mess, or it was, not, it was not a place where you could really be creative, and it was like scientists on this side and designer in another building, and there was no like, cross-pollination. And so I found a chicken farm, abandoned chicken farm, and I transformed it and I tried to build it in replica of what I had at MIT. I tried to replicate like a robotics lab in a, in a really rural um, environment. And so I built a small robotics lab in the countryside. But quickly, I ran out of space because when you make boats, it takes a lot of space. And I didn't realize that Hong Kong is the world's most unaffordable rental housing market. It's the most expensive rent anywhere in the world. And I didn't, I didn't compute that. Uh, so when I tried to look for a place to work, I could not afford anywhere. And so there were a couple of co-working spaces, uh, but they would not allow me to make dust or anything smell, or any, any smell. And I realized that anybody who is making things with their hands, who need more than just a co-working space, 
who is going to make dust or, or something smelly. All these people, fashion designer, architect, they all actually, they are, they are really, the, the cards are stacked against them, against them. Because you need a lot of capital to start any of this creative activity. And so I just started to reach out cold. I just took the yellow pages and Facebook or whatnot. and just started to reach out to people and say, hey, uh, how much would you be willing to pay uh, to uh, actually like, have uh, industrial space to be shared? To, can we build a co-working space for creators? And I also realized that even if I have those creative ideas, I can only do so much. But the, if I can have an influence, for example, on people like young people like you and make you care about the environment and think that you can be an entrepreneur for the environment, maybe you can have much, much more impact. So my belief is that I'm sure there's many more smart people than me in this uh, audience, and that uh, combined working together, we can have much more impact than, than I could ever have. And so this is when I realized, okay, if I want to make a change, I cannot do it by myself. I have to build a community. And so I found this most dirty uh, industrial space, cheapest industrial space that I could find. There were dead rats and cockroaches, and it was horrible. Pieces of the ceiling are falling down. It was like the worst space you could, you could find. It was the only place that I could afford. And uh, I just uh, cleaned the floor, and I called, called the people and said, hey, uh, I just cleaned it. Would you like to uh, make a, like a, a creative space? And we share the tools. And you can be a fashion designer, and you can be an architect, and you can be a mechanical engineer and a chemist, uh, a chemical engineer. We can all share this space. And uh, I called 100 people, and 40 people showed up in that, in that meetup. And with the 40 people, out of the 40 people that came, 10 of them actually sign up to actually become a tenant of the space. And so we have no money, so we have to repair everything ourselves. So we did all the construction uh, ourselves. So we have a lot of volunteers, a lot of women came to do the heavy lifting, and the men came to do the painting at the end. <laughs> but eventually, we had this very nice uh, space. And you have every tool you can imagine to build things with wood, with metal, uh, electronics. Uh, you can do PCBs or textile. We even have a dark room. You can have a biology, a, a biohacker space. Uh, and so in this space, we build everything from uh, working with the shelters for the, for the homeless. Uh, this was a summer program. We decided to build a Hong Kong first self-driving uh, vehicle from scratch. So we get a couple of students, mechanical engineer students, uh, electric engineer students, software engineer, uh, designer, a couple of artists, and then we basically build a, a car from scratch. Actually, not really from scratch. We basically cut a bunch of cars and kind of like stuck them together. Uh, and so we build the electric car, but then we cut all the control. So we cut the steering wheel, cut the pedal, and we put a motor, an engine on each of this. We automate it, put servers and all that stuff. And actually, the car is an Android car. So it's fully controlled with an Android system. So it's a, there's, a, there's a phone inside of it, and the brain of the car is, a, is an Android uh, system. So I'm going to show you how it looks uh, when it's finished. So the car doesn't have a front and doesn't have a back. That's my timer. Uh, so the, the car doesn't have a front, doesn't have a back. When you get close to the car, the car recognizes you, and uh, you don't do anything. It just goes into your calendar, or you can give it a vocal command. So you just say, hey, I'm going to go to this meeting, and it just takes you. Uh, there's no seats, no seat belts, uh, and basically it just is empty. And so you can sleep, you can uh, drink, you can do whatever you need to do, uh, and it just takes you to your next meeting. Uh, yeah, so that, that's the idea. You can do yoga on your way to work. And so the idea is that when you have a maker space, it's a place where you can just create whatever the hell you want. You, you, you don't have like a, a necessarily like an agenda. And so we presented this at the Formula uh, One, um, uh, the Formula E, sorry, Formula E uh, 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 competition. We did a bunch of other activities. We helped to like uh, map the, the genome of a bunch of uh, species. There were like a rare species in Hong Kong. Uh, we created uh, systems to map the movements of plastic trash in the city. So we built 110 uh, drifters that we put in the rivers, and then we track where the plastic is going. Uh, we built um, our, like uh, bio-inspired um, uh, drifters. So these are ocean drifters to measure the movement of uh, the trash in the ocean, but it's shaped like a sea nettle, so the animals were not trying to bite it because they know it's poisonous. Uh, we organized the uh, citizen science fair, so I'm going to go very fast, but basically we organized, we do hundreds of projects, always with a social and environmental impact. So the goal is always to use creativity to help the community, or help the environment, or help vulnerable people. So we also build shelters for the homeless people, organize a class for the refugee, 
uh, be a prosthetics for dogs, um, yeah, get retired people to like, repair stuff, uh, and, and so on and so on. And then people started to ask us, okay, we want to build a community and make a, an impact in our own neighborhood as well. And so we started to build makerspace for other people. And so we built those uh, makerspace, and we ended up building eight makerspaces in the low-income area. So we built basically innovation center in the poorest neighborhood in Hong Kong. And so then we would train the local social workers to work on their local social problems. Maybe they're going to help the local handicap or whatever is the problem that they have in the, in the neighborhood. And eventually, this caught the attention of uh, some delegation in Cambodia, and they asked us to run incubators in Cambodia. So we run this incubator to connect uh, teams where we have uh, four people. You have a farmer, a designer, a business person, and an engineer. And they were trying to think of how to modernize the agricultural sector uh, in, in Cambodia. And they, uh, in three months, a small team, we built uh, seven companies, and four of them actually started to actually exist after the program started to hire people. And because of that, uh, we were asked to build the largest innovation space in Cambodia. So we also built the innovation space in Phnom Penh. So similar model, but we're trying to build like an innovation center focused on social and environmental impact in, in, uh, in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia. I will go faster on those other things, but basically we do a lot of projects to uh, like, uh, address environmental issues. One of the recent projects is coral bots. Uh, so corals are dying, and we, uh, with the students, younger than you, we develop a system to actually map coral reef. At the beginning of the program, the students don't know any electronics. They are just middle school students. And uh, one of the students came up with this uh, crazy idea. Instead of using a mechanical device, it's called a quadrat. So it's this device that they use normally. Uh, this device is called a quadrat. This is how we measure coral today. Today, to measure coral reef, you swim, you put a square, you swim back, take a picture. <laughs> then you swim again, and you move it one meter away, swim back, take a picture. So we, we actually uh, calculated that if you do this technique, uh, by the time you have measured all the coral reefs, they will be, <laughs> all be dead. So that's too slow. So for my students, we, we asked them, okay, this is the state of the art. How do we do something better? And so my middle school student proposed to use a laser. So we flash a laser. Instead of putting a, a square, we project a square. And so like this, you don't have to go up and down. So the students, they've never done any electronics or any optics, and they just hack on the spot. They learn electronics on the job. Never done any optics, no problem. They learn. They never done any machining, they learn on the job. And so in three days, they built the first laser quadrat that I've ever heard of. Basically project a square, and like this, you don't have to swim down and up. You just project a square, take a picture, job done. You can just swim, take a picture, snap, snap, snap. And so uh, I didn't tell the local scientists uh, about our, uh, our, the age of my students, uh, but we, I just told the scientists, hello, we have this interesting invention. We'd like to present it to you to get some feedback. I didn't tell them that my students are like eight years old. <laughs> and so we just show up in the like, uh, best lab in Hong Kong to do like coral science. And they're like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, like, it's like children coming in. And so we just come in, and then they're very, very skeptical. But then they see the invention, they're like, oh, this is cool. And so they, they, they tested it, and they're like, oh, th that works. And so they were very excited about it. And they say, tomorrow you're going to the Marine Protected Area, MPA, and you're going to test your invention. And so we, we, we took it. You need to know that 30% uh, of my students actually are special needs students. They are like mental, uh, I don't know what's the PC way of saying it, but they have like mental uh, issues. Uh, so it's not like it's not about having like the smart and you know, like best uh, grading student. It was really about like just trying. And so we tried, and it kind of works quite okay. And then I really bother my student to document because it's part of the scientific process. You need to share, and so people don't make the same mistake as you, or they can build on top of what you've done. So the people typically don't like to document, but that's really important. And they did some of this image. They published it online, uh, and then. One year later, I received a phone call. Hey, I'm a master student in computer science in uh, HKU, and I would like to do this project as a master student project. I say, yeah, cool. And uh, I don't have money. I say, oh, okay, well, let's, uh, let's get some money. And so we write a grant, and we managed to get a grant to send 12 students in a remote island in the Philippines. And so we fly these uh, 12 students. It's an island, there's no stable electricity and no internet. So it was great for the computer science student. <laughs> they cannot go on Stack Overflow and you know, copy paste. They have to, uh, we built the robot. Half electronic come from Hong Kong, but the rest of the robot is come from the trash. We found trash on the beach, and we built this uh, robot from the bamboo that we cut in the forests. And so this, this uh, machine with plastic bottles from the beach has camera, and we take thousands of pictures on the water. 
and then we map those pictures, make super high resolution maps of coral reef, or even 3D maps of coral reef. And in the last uh, year, we actually also train an AI to identify the coral. So now we have enough picture that we train the AI to uh, map it. And the latest version of the coral robot has not one camera, but has five cameras. So like this, you have five cameras. Each camera takes a picture every second, uh, two pictures every second. So in, like, in two hours, in one session of battery, we can actually get like 36,000 pictures of coral. So you can tell how quickly we can train an AI with this kind of like data set. And so, yeah, so now it's more accurate than most human beings and more accurate than the majority of marine biologists, just on like first glance. And one of my students really liked the idea, but he's just like, hmm, I don't want to do coral. I want to capture plastic. And so after he graduated, so three years ago, he started a company called ClearBot. He used the exact same software that we use for mapping coral, but he used it to classify plastic in the, in the ocean. And so I'm helping him on the weekends and we're building uh, the prototype and recently, they got investment from Razer, uh, the uh, company, and from uh, Microsoft. And so now they're using this machine to capture some plastic in, in, the, in the port. So I'm really proud of my students. They are now actually making more money than me <laughs> uh, by uh, making those like startup, uh, using something for like coral or generally uh, to like capture plastic. So you can look them up, uh, Clebot. I'm going to go very, very quickly through the very last one, but. Uh, I'm going to skip this one, but basically, I recently built a, a floating solar hydrogen uh, plant. So I, I, but I will explain more in the, in the next one. Okay, so this is 2022, and I've shown you a sort of progression, right? First, uh, like sort of my family religion uh, sort of pushed me to have a political desire, you know, uh, but it's evolved. And uh, three months ago, I built a project for the first time. I feel like instead of, um, you know, repairing something that is broken, I feel I'm finally uh, trying to go at the root cause and trying to do something that is uh, helpful. So I was, two months ago, I was in Bali. And uh, we were trying to see if we could uh, bring a decentralized uh, energy network to people who are living on the coastal area. And so we drive around and meet people uh, around Bali. And eventually, we came up with this concept. The idea is that um, right now, we compare solar and lithium battery to solar and hydrogen. Efficiency of solar to lithium iron is about 70%. You lose 15% when you charge the battery, and you lose 15% when you discharge the battery in heat, mostly. Hydrogen, you lose 70%. So you have only 30% efficiency because you have to electrolyze uh, the water, then you have to compress the gas, and then you have to run it through a fuel cell. This idea is that we're going to be in the sea, and we are uh, using the solar power in the sea to produce hydrogen. So we use electro uh, electrolysis, but we don't compress it at high pressure, just one or two atmosphere, so low pressure, which means that you can transport it in a balloon, and you can uh, distribute it locally. It's low pressure, so it's not dangerous. And, uh, and the idea that you can use hydrogen to, um, uh, to move your vehicle you can use hydrogen to electricity and hydrogen for cooking. So one source of clean energy, you can use it. There's no byproduct. When you burn it, it just goes back. And the idea is that I think that uh, because there's no real limit, there's so much space in the ocean, we could actually really scale this technology. So this is what I'm researching right now, is how we could make this so that this infrastructure, energy infrastructure, doesn't belong to a big energy company, but belongs to the coastal, coastal people. So uh, the conclusion is this is that for me, I can't believe how slow it's been for me to sort of figure out that I want to do something to actually address the problem. The reason why I make this presentation is because I hope you can skip all of this. Uh, I hope that you can skip and go directly to do something that is useful, but it's also like financially viable. If you can use your energy to do something for the environment, but you can also make money in the process, it is possible and it's really, really desirable. Uh, yeah, this is how I feel.
But I said, if you would just give me a mulligan on this quicksand condition, I promise, I promise, no more being on shorter creatures. <laughs> Yeah, so I just want, I wanted to share this because I feel like it's taken me like 20 years to sort of go through these different stages. Um, So I wanted to show this. Uh, this is um, the the COP21, uh, the president of the COP21, who is basically said that they basically didn't manage to, you know, to keep the, the target, and is basically saying 1.5 degrees is, is probably not going to happen, and that they, they failed essentially. And so uh, what I want to uh, sort of finish with is that uh, I, I feel like the the situation and where we are now, we we sort of going through this emotional cycle, right? Like we're thinking about we want to do something good, we also need to make money, we need to, we have our life plans, etc. Uh, and there's this like, those impeding, gigantic uh, like challenges that are, uh, that are attending for us. Uh, the world is going to get warmer. Uh, it's, it's hard to see how we're going to sort of reverse the curve. Uh, the world is unfortunately deglobalizing. So you guys are, you know, in a situation where you can freely travel, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do that for, you know, this, this kind of freely for, for a very long time. I made this uh, map. These are the country uh, in blue that are condemning uh, attack of Russia on Ukraine. And in red, the country they're actually saying either they're not saying anything or they, 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 they actually support it. And actually from the perspective of, uh, you know, if you grow up in the West, we have a tendency to imagine that, oh, if they do something morally wrong, everybody must be disagreeing with them, right? But actually the world is not so like unilateral, actually. It's pretty balanced, like it's almost like equal, equal in terms of like uh, size. And if it's population, there's more people on the red side, actually. Um, and so now we are entering a, uh, a part of the history which is gonna be highly volatile because we have uh, like, uh, like superpower going down and new power coming up. And usually when they cross, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of friction between the number one that does, that does not want to give up their spot. So uh, the rich are getting richer, and the people are feeling there's less and less representation of them. Uh, democracy, liberal democracy are in decline. And so we're in a situation where uh, the world is more unstable. And personally, I feel that, you know, we feel that COVID was really highly disruptive, but I feel that the crises that are coming are actually way, way bigger. Uh, when the climate really, really changes and it really affects biodiversity, uh, this is like a whole different ball game because then all the food chain will be disrupted. And so like all the things we think about, like, you know, our daily comfort, is going to be, it's going to, it's like what, I feel like COVID is basically walking apart in comparison to what's, what's awaiting us. And this is the reason why I really uh, think, uh, even though, I, I feel that those principles, uh, at least for me, they have been working and they, and I, and I invite you sort of to, 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 to try it. 2026, my dream is that by 2025, I want to keep building more of these floating solar to hydrogen. I'm starting to make designs for it and starting to write grants for it. 2050, I hope that I have this dream of this kind of floating city uh, that can actually be like sustainable and they can produce their own energy and being net positive for the environment. And my model is the Argo system. 
Each of the points you see here is a drifter. And this is the best instrument we have today to actually understand climate change. These are called drifters. They go at the bottom of the sea. They measure the temperature at the bottom of the sea. And the ocean is distributing the heat of the planet. So the ocean controls the climate. So I want to build a system that is similar to that, but on the surface for developing solutions for, for the climate. And 2000, the world will be so different. Uh, in 2000, the 100 biggest city, none of the top 100 will be uh, in China, for example. Like, the, yeah, most of them will be in Africa. I, I will, because the time is running, I, will, I just want to uh, give you the, 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 the conclusion. So my conclusion is this. Uh, personally, my, my, my journey, even though I've been out of politics, at the beginning I was telling I was doing some political activism, but now it's mostly out of it. But deep down, I'm still trying to be an environmental activist through different channels. Uh, all the things that we do every day actually can contribute to this, whether it's art, whether it's discussing with other people, all the stuff that we can do is, can actually be political. My, uh, the only thing I would like you to, to walk away with is, is this uh, sort of, um, I would like to, to, to propose you this thought experiment. Today, the world is basically driven by money. We use technology and we use people, human resources, and the environment is just extraction. We just extract from the environment. This is how we are running the world right now, and this is why we're destroying the environment, because this is our order of priority, make money. What if we actually build companies for which the primary goal is to actually make money? Uh, to make environment, sorry. <laughs> yes. uh, what if the, 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 the first goal of the company would be actually to like, do something good for the environment? How different would those companies be, right? Like, how different would the business look like? Slip of the tongue. Anyway, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's my message for you. If you can think about this, I, I really appreciate your, your thoughts and what you think it could look like. Thanks very much.